Hello and welcome to Stefan's Classroom, where we today are going to look at writing a master thesis. Or rather, let me be absolutely correct here, we're going to be looking at writing an empirical master thesis. And I would like to call this the complete edition as well. There's a previous presentation on my channel regarding this topic here. However, I would like to take the opportunity to expand on that and discuss all subjects or all topics, sections you would need in a master thesis. So compared to the other edition you may have seen on this channel here, we're going to be discussing the literature section, the introduction, the discussion and conclusion, and of course also the conclusion. Simply all of it together, plus I'll elaborate further and simply also give part of the same presentation. So heads up, this presentation for the most is similar to the one already given on this channel. But hopefully the additional sections here can help you further understand what you need to write a good master thesis. Now, let's get to it. So, first of all, a table of contents, so you can also get a quick look at what's gonna happen here. So of course, we're gonna start first with, why is this even important? Like, why would you write a master thesis? Why is this even like something you want to do besides the teachers, your teachers telling you to? That's what we're gonna start with. Then we're gonna come with the literature review, which of course is different from the previous video here on this channel. Mm -hmm. And we're going to dive into the methodology, the numbers, the equations you're going to be using, and explain all what needs to go in this section. This, of course, will be followed up with the nice data section. And I cannot be too precise here, or what do I mean? Cannot elaborate this enough, or be explicit enough, or say this is so important, this section, because this really deems how good your fees would be. Well, of course, all sections are important, and they surely are. But I would like to say that it's very important you obtain your data in time. Otherwise, this is what can make and break your thesis. But more about that when we get to the section later. Then, of course, we look at the results. What are you produced? Applying your methodology on the data that you obtained. What do you get? And how do we actually discuss this? What can you conclude from this? And this, of course, is a new addition as well. Along with the introduction. And, um, hmm... I know what you may be thinking, but introduction does not usually come first. Well, that is true. But in terms of the way you were writing, as we're gonna, uh, the way you were writing all this, as you're gonna see in the extra section, it may not be in that exact order. So I also put the introduction down there. And with that said, let's get to it. Starting with, why is this important? Why is this important to do? First of all, the master thesis, looking at as a whole, is the most important grade you're ever going to receive. Let me highlight one thing here. All the things reflected here is my advice. Take it or leave it. It is not written in stone. It's the only way to do it. But I believe this is your most important grade. Because, well, now I'm reflecting on a finance program, but it applies to many other programs as well. Whether you're from economics, international financial management, accounting, whatnot. All of these, or most of you guys, will be writing an empirical thesis. You're going to be applying some data that you've collected and different regression models or other techniques. And of course, doing a really good and appropriate analysis is the key to great success in a master thesis. But why is this your most important grade? Again, I didn't explain that thoroughly, did I now? No. What is most important here is because, of course, your future employer will, of course, look at your average. Did you get your degree, right? But if they want to look at any single grade, it will be the master thesis first, because that reflects your independent work and your ability to undertake a greater and bigger project. Hence why it is such an important grade. I cannot stress that enough. And what is it also a showcase of? Well, your ability to sell results. In a sense, that, in a sense it doesn't really matter so much what you sell, whether it's good results, bad results, no results, or whatnot. No, it is about how you sell it. And maybe you're going to sound like a salesperson and maybe be like, oh, but does it really matter? Or did I have something important for society or not? That's not the point exactly. Well, what I mean by this is, often you undertake a nice study, interesting research question, everything is fine, but you don't find anything in the sense that you do not obtain any significant results. In other words, they're insignificant. Thanks, Slowpoke. No, then it's ability for you to sell this as interesting because please do not forget, and this is the, the most important thing here, no results are also results. I cannot stress that enough. So 
Again, it's not so much what you sell that matters, it's how you sell it. And let's go a little further into that with starting with the literature review section. Well, needless to say, this shouldn't just be a list of books you have read saying, hey guys, hey, whoever is reading this, these are the books that I read, articles that I read, YouTube videos I've seen with, with or without kitties in them that have dealt with the same topic. No, that will give an ultimately the most boring thing ever. I'm not sitting here, gonna sit here and say the literature review is the most exciting thing to write. It surely is not. But you could at least try and make it interesting for your reader. And to make a good one can also really put a nice theoretical foundation to your thesis and really motivate. Well, what are you actually supposed to do here? You're trying to build upon the literature. You're not reinventing the wheel here. No, you're gonna go in and say, okay, on this same topic here, what is the underlying literature, the previous literature, from which I can then produce or make my own research question, from which it should spring from, right? So before you start answering your research question with data, well, we need to figure out where it comes from. What do you have to do first? What you would have to do is as follows. You would first have to develop some idea about what you can even expect. And that has to be based on the previous literature out there in the field. And that's what you should start with doing in a literature review. Also, you have to, of course, outline what theories do exist, because there's always something there. It's very rarely you start in an area where there's nothing written about it, because then you're literally breaking new ground, which I'm not saying that never happens, but it's rare. And it'll be really cool if you do so. But in any case, or in general, you have to write about what are the existing theories out there, right? Following that, you should, of course, also talk about what these theories you have presented predicts. Because, of course, you cannot just say, there's this theory out there. Great. What about it? No, you have to also come back and telling what does this theory actually predict. And it could indeed be that there are different opinions. Could be there's two mainstream ways or more. And you should, of course, highlight each one of them. And also highlight if there's been a debate in the, in the literature about these. Why should you go for one over the other? And so forth. All these things has to be neatly outlined such there's a nice red thread to it in your literature section. And of course, this is supplemented with the evidence they have found. Whether or not that's going to contradict with the results you find, well, time will tell. But often is you're relating to, hey, this guy found this, but that is in line with what I'm finding here, but I'm doing a different setting or I find something different because I did this and this and that. For instance. So it's very important for you to do. And of course, it should always be supplemented with other important factors that you find, other important factors that you consider. All this together should ultimately boil down to you figuring out, well, what is your nice research question? So you're simply just putting all these points of views together into developing your hypothesis that you want to test. Sure, it can also be more than one, but now I'm just writing it as if there's one. Indeed, Slobo, very good. So this should all boil nicely down to, well, that hypothesis that you want to test. Which brings us to the methodology section. And just to, at this point, recap a little bit, because this was a little new thing, right, compared to the previous presentation. At this point, you are right now. You have, based on your review, developed the hypothesis that you want to test. That is, in this section, you're actually taking this hypothesis and being even more specific about how you're going to test it using data. In other words, that is, you found a subject of interest, you found some related literature, of course, and you've got an overview of what has been done and found, and you have then selected an empirical paper you like and understand. I cannot stress how important it is that you understand that paper or the one or two paper you have decided. I am also, of course, again, Highlighted here again, thanks for the support, Slowpoke, stating indeed, you have to understand the paper you're writing about. I've already, unfortunately, had many cases of students which have presented a paper or basically based their entire master thesis on one or two papers, from which it sure turns out they, they didn't really understand what they were doing. That, needless to say, that ain't very good, guys. So do not do this. Really take that extra read through or two or three to be sure you understand what they did in their previous paper or in their paper or what he or she did. If it's one author, right, 
could be one offer, it could be multiple. Nevertheless, it's extremely important. So don't try to shortcut there. What is your goal here? You have developed a hypothesis based on your literature review, and now you're transforming that into a statistical hypothesis you want to test. So you can present as a null and alternative hypothesis, and you can then apply your data from which is going to come in a later section, of course, in order to test this. That's what you're trying to do. Furthermore, there's of course more you're doing here, of course. You're also going to include the following things. Or in other words, what are you trying to answer on top of what we have just discussed? Well, you first need to lay out what data do you need in order to test this hypothesis? Like, what do you need to actually collect here? And you also would have to present the equation or equations that you wish to estimate. I put an example up here, label nicely equation number one. This one is taken straight out of my own master thesis, which later was rewritten into a published paper. From where you can see here, we use nice subscripts here. In this case here, you have panel data, hence the subscript I and J. We clearly outline what each of the things are. So we have a very important variables here, access, take up, and their interaction. And of course, we also have capital X just denoting any other control variables there. You can indeed see here, we did, I did not on purpose write up every single variable because you would distinguish between what is important and what is less important. And indeed, state what are the important control variables that you consider in your model. And furthermore, what do you expect to find for these variables? The important ones as well as the less important ones. Like, what do you expect? Do age have a positive or negative impact on your uh, outcome variable here? In my case here, how does take up refer to this? How does access do it? What do, you ex what do I expect from the interaction term here? Explain all the things you expect to find, or what does it mean if you find them? At least outline it here. And of course, how does the significance of these terms here relate to your or our general hypothesis? In my case here, the most important here, the most important parameter was the theta parameter attached to the interaction term between take up and access. From which I would have to explain what does that actually mean if that turns out positive or negative. Sure, if it turns out as nothing, great. Well, not so great because then I didn't find anything in this case here. In my case here, yes I did, but read the paper. I'll refer to it later if you want to. But that is indeed what you have to try and answer here. But above all, the most important thing you have to do is what justifies this approach. Regardless of what you choose, you have to explain all the readers why is this approach appropriate? I can't, cannot stress this enough. Like this is so important. So many students miss this part. They just say, I use OLS because that's what I learned in class. That doesn't really sell does it now. No, you have to tell and motivate why was OLS your choice here? Or why would you have to use another technique? GMM for instance, IV estimates, whatever. It doesn't matter. You have to just justify your approach here. So in order to tell, why does this not suffer heterogeneity? What does it fix? What does it not fix, maybe? You really have to justify what you are doing here. I cannot stress how important it is. Okay, with that said, let's go into the data section, okay? Whew. And here, you would have to describe the data you have collected. Simply just give the reader a feeling for what you have been doing with all this data here. You have to remember you may have played around with this data for weeks, months even, but the reader has only read your thesis. Therefore, you should not only tell just the sources, I found the data from A, found the data from B, no, no, no. You also have to give them the descriptive statistics and simply explain to them how you arrived at the data set you are testing or you're using for your results later, right? So, to highlight that up again here, <coughs> sorry for that, Give the summary statistics, both of the dependent and independent variable, incredibly important. And of course, you would also have to present this from different subsamples. For instance, if you have sample from different countries, EU, non-EU, OECD versus non-OECD, you could also look at different years. Simply also by different thresholds, suppose you have age, you can look for older people versus younger people, you can split a male, female, whatnot. It's simply just to give an idea of what you can expect from this data or simply just try to show the reader what you have done or how you arrived at this. And as Slowpoke here is telling, which is true, balancing tests. 
Are there any significant differences between these subsamples? This can just be done with a simple t-test, for instance. But what I typically like to do is simply just run a regression to the mean or run a regression on this dummy indicating each of the subsections. Because then I can, for instance, on top of just doing my balancing test, I can actually just cluster my stand arrows. But that's a completely different discussion on what that actually is good for, and what it actually does for you. But this is just to highlight, well, what can you do with it? And a lot of students, they neglect this whole balancing test stuff. And I think that's really, really important to really give a good feel for the data. And also what you can maybe expect in robustness tests later on, or your sub-hypotheses, or whatnot. There's so many things you can do here. But okay, then you have to make some decisions. Because you have to keep in mind, you have to inform the reader, but you also don't want to confuse the reader. So think about that a little bit. So you have to think about what goes in the main uh, section and what is just appendix stuff. For instance, all these really detailed subtests are, are like tests for some, you know, is the data stationary or not, and give some additional graphs, give, you know, really detailed explanation from your survey from where you collect the data. All these things, they're just appendix stuff. All these things are appendix. And then you could think about, well, why would I even do them? Well, you still have to show your supervisor, your co-supervisor, your readers, it's your master thesis after all, to show them what you can do. So just because it goes in the appendix doesn't mean it was not important. It's just more about how you present it. You don't want to bore the reader with all these correlation matrix stationarity tests and so forth. It's not that they're not important, but they're better suited for the appendix. So please keep that in mind when you are writing up this section. It can quickly become very, very boring from which you also have to keep another few things in mind. When you have made these nice sum of six tables, well, how do you explain them in a way that you don't bore the reader to death? You don't want to do that. No, 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 no. So the way we do it is as follows. Let's look at this here. So some notes. You don't always have to report a complete table. You can always report some of it, leave the rest for the appendix. But you have to try and make it interesting to read. Like, you would have to say, for instance, I put a do here, but I can also show you a don't. But let's start with a do. You can talk about the average household in our sample reporting column A in table one, varies between this and that. And there's also quite some variation in age you can see for the standard deviation. I'm just trying to, you know, incorporate a little more interesting word choice and compare these results to each other. Just, just a cursory look over the data just to give a quick view. Yeah, you may think, oh, but this is not even that nice to read, but I can tell you, this is much better than writing, say, the following, which is a clear don't. Column one reports average age, country this, country B is that, country C is that, and just keep going listing all of them. That is plain you, as you can see. It is just terrible. Do not do this. That bores everyone. At least try to play with your words a little bit. We don't have to be a great writer, like a great uh, novel writer, to write a good masterpiece, but you can definitely put a little more work into how to present your data. That would definitely make for a lot better read than just mindlessly presenting it line by line and bore everybody out of their minds. Please don't. Okay, that lines up the, the data section. Let's jump into results because now you have taken your methodology, applied it on the data set that you have collected, and now it's time to present the main results. This is what everybody's been looking forward to, because what have you found? Well, try, maybe counterintuitive to you, because you want to show everything you did, but try only using a few main tables. Preferably, you can even do it with one. You see many publications just have one main table. The rest is just appendix or robustness section. Robustness what, you may think? Like, huh? Like, what, what is that? Well, that is just to show how robust are your sample. How robust are your results, sorry to different subsections, subsamples, different columns, different variable choices, so and so on. You have to show the reader that these results that you present here or these results that you found are robust. All these other robustnesses can either go in their own little subsection in the results or simply just back in the appendix with it. So keep the number of tables you use here quite size. Keep it brief, not too many. That should definitely make for a very good result section. The same guideline applies here as before in terms of how to present them. And let's put in some do's and don'ts here. For instance, 
you have to, when you do your results here, not just state statistically what you see, but also try to give some meaning to them. Bring them to life. Like for instance, let's start with a do, or now a don't in this case, now we'll put it the other way around. Like you say here, the sign of beta is positive and significant. Well, that may be true, you're just observing it, it is positive and significant, but it doesn't give any economic intuition. It's pretty just a dead sentence in the sense, just bleh, it's just boring. For instance, you could add a little extra to it just by saying, well, it indicates the investors face a systematic risk are rewarded with higher stock return. It's just standard cap M interpretation for those of you who know it, but for those of you who don't, no worries. This is just to show to you, add a little more, well, interest to interpreting your salt. Make them come to life, write a little more colorful even. Like you are writing a master thesis. Sure, you have to present something and you want to sell it, but you're going to make it interesting. Try your best to do so. That will be a very good idea. Now, in terms of presenting your results, sure, you also have to look at the tables themselves. And now, for anybody who's been in my class, you may or may not have been, you know how important I find tables to be. Tables, above all, has to be self-contained. Look at the nice little poster I put up here, a nice little sign. What does self-contained mean? It simply just means the reader should be able to understand everything that is presented in the table without having to read the text of the paper. So by just looking at the table itself, with the table notes below, you know, the little small text either below or above the table, you have to be able to understand fully what is reported there. So you have to outline simply everything to some extent. Let me give you an example of that. Putting up here from the same paper as the regression equation from the methodology section, here is the table. You see, first of all, it has a nice clear title. And here we also explain the underlying regression. I explain all the variables, treatment, year, year times treatment, for instance, just as an example. And actually, now I want to think about it. The methodology section equation is different from this one. It's from different papers. So I mix two things here. I apologize for that. But you see here, I give clear descriptive names. I have a consistent amount of decimals. And I use indeed the standard stars to indicate a level of significance, further explained in my table notes. And of course, as standard for most journals, I put the coefficients and below them, I put the standard error. Some journals may just want t-stats below. That depends on the journal style. But the one shown here is the one you typically will see in a financial journal, for instance. So this is an example of how to make a table self-contained. Okay, so with that said, Let's go over to the discussion and conclusion, which of course is an add on for this presentation here. And when you get that far, you have now presented your results and now you come to discuss them and conclude on your paper. First of all, present a short summary of what you did. Just give the reader just a little quick, quick roundup what you actually did. Yes, it may sound like repetition, but the way the reader would read your paper may surprise you a bit. Abstract introduction, jump down, read the discussion conclusion, if they're put together or just a conclusion otherwise. So you see, they quickly, quickly go through your papers. That's why it's a good idea to sum up what you did. Following that, you should of course explain what does your result mean? What do they even mean here? Like you have a positive significant beta here, but what does it actually mean in an economic context and in relation to your hypothesis that you presented? And of course, reflect critically on what you found. Simply go over again and again, or not again and again, but just go critically over what this actually mean. Don't be afraid to criticize your paper, but yourself there, but also just, you know, just be realistic. What did you find and what does it actually mean? And of course, there's always limitations to what we do. There's some future research possibilities. A good paper would typically also be you know, honest about its limitations. Say you use this model, but you could also try, you could explain, hey, it would be cool to have found more data on these and these countries or further back or whatnot. <coughs> or you could also, of course, outline what could be future, uh, what is more, what is the avenues for future research related to this here. And of course, is this relevant? Societal relevance. Is this relevant? Relevant for politicians, NGOs, the government, private people? Who's it relevant for? What does this actually mean in you know context of say global environment or whatnot? What comes out of this? 
all this here pulled together in your discussion and conclusion. Now, this brings me to the introduction, and you're absolutely right, Slowbook. Doesn't introduction usually come first? Well, I already said that in the beginning of the presentation, but why do I put it here at the end? That's because when you typically write a master thesis, this is actually the last section you would write. And I'm going to say it right there. It is also the hardest one to write. I've written many introductions already in my short career, and it's it hasn't gone any easier yet. Some people have a gift for writing these. I certainly don't. So that's also why I'm very thankful when my PhD supervisor introduced me to the introduction formula, a nice document that gives you a nice helping hand on how to write an introduction. For those of you who are interested, I put it in the comment section below in the link here so you can find the document and download for yourself to read it more in detail. But to explain it in a brief few points here, it summarizes what I believe in five points that should be contained in your introduction. Starting off with a hook, you have to attract the reader's attention simply right from the start. You have to be able to make them want to read this and make it interesting. But of course, there's also a few things to avoid. Don't just write something that's like clear bait and then switch to a completely different thing. So you just caught them attention and kind of disappoint them. That's kind of in a terms of a YouTube video. This is also what meant by a clickbait, right? You click it like, ooh, wonder what happens next. You will never guess. Oh, terrible. And here, you can also not just say, ah, because everybody else is doing, all my other friends in my class are doing it, I'm also doing the same thing. That will make for a terrible introduction, terrible hook, terrible, terrible, do not do that. The second part of the introduction should then be the question you state. Tell the reader straight up, what is this paper actually about? What does it do? Right? Very, very important. And then you have the attendances, uh, I have to be able to pronounce this correctly, antecedents. There we go, that's a little better. Not a stellar word here, not a stellar performance here, but better than nothing. You have to identify important prior work. And then, of course, following up from that, you, of course, add the value in, in terms of describing briefly. It's not a literature review inside your introduction. No, 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 but you have to briefly describe the contribution, the most important ones. That puts out the groundwork for your paper. And finally, you have to give the roadmap. We all seen it. Lecture section two does this, three does that, four does that. But try not to be too generic. I know a lot of people have a very generic roadmap and it becomes incredibly boring incredibly quickly, but just take yourself a little extra time to write a nice little roadmap in the end of your introduction. Again, I've put the paper here in the description below so you can download it because I think it's super good value for your thesis. With that said, we have now come to the extras I would like to tell. Just a few other tips and tricks compared or in addition to what I've already told you. First of all, in practice, the thesis is never written down the order it's presented. That already comes that you should already know based on I said the introduction typically comes last. Right? But it also means you also end by writing your abstract, right? So think about it. I sometimes typically start with my data, but of course if you have very uh, literature heavy thesis to write, you should of course start with a literature section. Start writing up a good review. <laughs> Ooh, a little snotty these days. Wow. And then of course you have to think about how much time does it get to get my data. A lot of students I have underestimate how much time it took to get their data. They spent the first couple months and then they only have like say a month or two to write their entire thesis. That cramps up your time so please manage your time properly. Please don't bite off more than you can chew in terms of getting the data on time. So write it up. Be very clear in your planning. Be careful. And of course, I'd like to highlight it again. Please do not be afraid of no results. No results or still results can still provide an excellent master thesis. So finding nothing is also finding something. Please remember that. And please plan your time carefully. I've already said that like not a minute ago. But please do it. The key to great success masterpiece is simply just to plan your time carefully. Otherwise, you end up writing everything last week and you make a terrible thesis because it's hasty work. Don't do that. Plan your time carefully. And with that said, I would like to thank everybody for your attention. This was the presentation about how to write a masterpiece. Again, these are just my, well, tips and tricks. Take it or leave it. And of course, 
If you're new to the channel, go and check it out. Starter How To. That's also important if you're writing your thesis right. How do you actually run the results in Starter? I got further videos on research methods and also a lot of other fun stuff for those who are interested. My name is Stefan Eriksson and thank you very much for watching and have a great day. Thank you.